What's up, y'all? This is Mitty Murdoch. You watching Heritage Hip Hop. I'm a fan of Heritage Hip Hop. Yo, go find HeritageHipHop.com and log in, tune in to the greatest thing you could ever come across your screen, across your ears, your heart, your mind, and your soul. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Welcome back to Heritage Hip Hop, where hip hop is a serious thing to us. Not only do we introduce you to your future favorite artists today, but also the legends that tomorrow is going to document. Today I have two people on Heritage Hip Hop that not only changing the understanding of how hip hop is perceived, but also changing the palette to how hip hop can be digested. Introduce yourself to the people, please. What's good, y'all? Shout out to Heritage Hip Hop first and foremost, but I'm Mitty Murdoch, you know, I'm in the building, I'm a North native, I'm here. Stan Ipkiss, producer, New Jersey, North native, born and raised, so yeah, have fun. Award-winning producer, oh, yeah. by the way. Absolutely. Award-winning. Yeah. You got a lot of them things up there. There's a lot of ass up there. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, let's talk about who you are and what you represent. I don't like to talk about current events too much, but I think it's necessary because people are on a high right now of the versus, Nas, COVID, heat wave. And all four of those topics actually represent something that you do very well. So let's break that down. Let's start with Mitty. Being an MC from a city like Nort is very dangerous because you have you have a reputation to uphold, a city to represent, and you also have a sound that has to be representative. How did you come up with your sound and your style? And how, what's the furthest you believe you've taken it? Um, so, honestly speaking, um, when it, when it comes to my sound or my style, I think it's, it's original because it's, it's me. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't really listen to a lot of artists, um, coming from the era that I come from. So, you know, we, the era that we, we actually came from, there was a plethora of music to digest. So you got, you had so many different artists that you can listen to and grab from um, and I think that's what every artist so you know you kind of it's the same thing with art you study different artists as you, you know you practice your, your craft until you come up with your own style and I've been doing music since 1989 and I was hopping turnstiles going to the city in the studio in 1989 <laughs> you know what I mean so over the years you know you practicing practicing me battling and running into different MCs and you know and I did that across the country um, and I figured out me but Currently, in the state of in the state of where hip hop is now, and as far as me me is concerned, um, the style that I used on, on on the album that I got um, was was a reflection of uh, of myself and, and the condition that I'm living in. And listening to you know so much stuff that's out right now, which I really pay attention to, I really pay attention to um, because it's, it's 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 formatted in a way where it's repetitively, repetitively played into somebody's ears, so you gotta like it, you gotta listen to it, you know, and there's no creativity. Um, all, everything sounds the same to me. Um, this is this my opinion, you know what I mean? Everybody got their own opinion. And just listening to all of that, I had to figure out a way to change the dynamic of what I was listening to and what I was hearing, you know? So that, that for me, my style was just, you know, um, a countermeasure. Countermeasure, okay. That's used in sports and it's used in combat. Right. So what is hip hop for you? Combative or sport? Neither. It's therapy. Therapy. Which brings us to headphone therapy. Because it's music me. is written as what can calm the savage beast. Mm -hmm. People use music as therapeutic. Um, a therapeutic measure to temper their sound their intelligence and even their emotions. People play music when they want to get some butt. People play music when they study, if they know how to study correctly and not memorize. And most importantly, people play music to help people through trauma. How has you forming your own style of production helped you learn about yourself and identify that there's something special in you that is able to connect with somebody else? I don't necessarily um, think I have a style. 
because I'm extremely eclectic. Like I listen to everything. When I say everything, everything from soundtracks to uh, all genres. Like if if if, if a, whatever the genre is, if if it touches me, whatever way. If the if the melody is good, if the drums are good, I, I like it, no matter what it is. So I incorporate that with my music. And me me being so eclectic and not afraid to apply that to my music, that's that's what to me forms my therapy. Like when I when I make music, it's basically for me. Everything that I make is for me. I know somebody's gonna like it, but it's mainly for me. Like I make it, I present it to people. Somehow it forms, like this album. So, hmm. yeah. That's interesting. Cause I'm a flip flop back to the MC. Part of music for a rapper is having a team finding himself and then either being a part of a team or going at it on his own road. I've been asked about you for years. And someone actually said, yo, whatever happened to IOF? Whatever happened to this? What happened to that? that? And they have been in my ear for the past six months. And when I told them, I have one of them I'm gonna interview, the number one question that came out from everything that they asked me to ask, or the one thing I could sum up is growth. When you measure a man, you measure him by growth. How has your journey from being the rapper who picked up his pen to the man who's talking about trauma now take you from your solo to your group to your evolution as a professional in, in, in hip hop? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so when you go back, um, as a solo artist, the first project I ever really did as album-wise professionally was in 1993. Um, then I was doing, uh, I had, my man took me to see uh, KG brother Poop uh, from Naughty by Nature. Um, Poop was their manager. Um, and he actually listened to a, a, some stuff that I did. And then you know, he introduced me to Milk Bone. And from that it was just, <laughs> a, a door open, you know, I ended up going on tour with Milk for, for years of change, came home and experiencing being on the road because my friends didn't go, you know what I'm saying? Like, my homies, for me, it was it was, it was was stages before we even got to IOF, so it was 93, it was me, it was, it was the Lil Mitty, that's what my name was, uh, Lil Mitty, and then it was, uh, I went from now. It was a bunch of different transitions, and then we, we, we created a crew called uh, the Cycle War, you know. And we was building a team of uh, MCs before we even heard of the Wu Tang. It was about 15 of us on the corner of Chadwick and West Bigelow doing this stuff. Um, and as we advanced more and more, we started developing. You know, everybody had their own little unique style, and we going across the city. I had already went across the country doing this stuff, so I'm on tour, you know, experiencing different states and different styles of life, different cultures of life. And I had to bring that home. So when I brought it home, you know, we, we started. Uh, it was Ace and, Tr and True who actually came up with the, the name for IOF. Um, and we built from that point, you know, and we started doing crazy records. You know, we had it was the transition to go back to what you said. Now, let me just think about it for a minute. Go back what you said as far as the artist. When you engulfed in the city of Newark, you prone to become a product of your environment, right? So, we was in the streets, we got involved in gangs, we dealing with gang stuff, so that, that was intertwined in the music, but it wasn't to the point where we was teaching people negative behavior, because before we started involving ourselves in gangs, we already had knowledge of ourselves. We would be the only dudes on the block we thugged out, whatever you want to call it, but we got book bags on with books in our bag and we studying, you know what I mean? So that was something that we did have that a lot of people wasn't doing in our age bracket anyway. And then we had some rough bumps in the road dealing with IOF. Like, you know, we 
the first record that I did with um, well, it wasn't the first record, but one of the records I did with the Zoo Crew was called a joint, uh, a joint called Keep It Jumping. I did the beat, and it was me, Supreme C, and Pizzazz on that record. Um, somehow the record get to Miami and, and got the pup because we met up with Dr. Dre and Snoop and um, in Philly, and that's when uh, Dre left the other label he was doing Aftermath. Did this joint called 24 Hours to Live. And somehow that record got leaked in, in Miami to Puff, and a couple weeks later we heard that joint on the radio, you know? So it was, it was kind of hectic for us. And then, time go on, you know, we don't really care about it. Because we're young, we, we just into the game, we love it, you know what I mean? And later on, you know, we, we doing records. I, had, I was doing a solo album, it was one of my solo albums, but my albums never was solo, because I always had my brothers on it. Um, and then I gave True, shout out to O50, uh, True Trilla, I gave True Trilla a solo record on that album. Um, it was called Straight Like That. So it was his two verses and my, it was two verses of him and one verse from me. And I think Ace was on the MTV Battle um, thing on, on BET at the time. I think it was MTV or something. He was battling on, on TV and Ludacris and Kanye was the judges. You know, so we backstage giving out our music and all this other stuff. You know, and then <laughs> one day we sitting in True House and we listening to the radio and, uh, you know, Wendy Williams on the radio and she like, yeah, it's a North Face group uh, suing uh, Ludacris for a record and we don't even know what's going on. We like, what? We don't even, we ain't, we ain't even know nothing about it. But, you know, Sav was hitting us like, yo, y'all need to hear that joint. That nigga stole y'all shit. You know what I mean? So, you know, we listened to it and, you know, the brothers that we was messing with, that was the older brothers, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a deep story, but we gonna, we gonna get into that a little, a little bit later, but, um, <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't bite my tongue for nobody, man. And, and anyway, um, First bracket. <laughs> we end up on the court. It's a fifty million dollar case. Uh, Luda had like two or three lawyers with him. We in the hood. We ain't got that kind of money. You know what I'm saying? And the lawyer that we had <laughs> never came to. We had. We actually had a musicologist study the song word for word, line for line, beat everything. She like y'all got this shit hands down. The lawyer we had, he never showed back up for court. Oh, well, they bought him off. Right. Okay. Disappeared. Kind of caused chaos amongst us because, you know, my man brother is the one who started this, the lawsuit from the beginning and it was just a bunch of chaos and, you know, so we was going through some turmoil inside. After that, you know, we started going our separate ways and me and True started doing music together for some time. After a while, I got bored with it. You know what I mean? We started doing 050, doing music with them, getting some music with the, the gatekeepers, that's what they what we call them, the gatekeepers, those who came before us. Um, and the energy was just off to me, you know what I mean? It was just off, like dudes was really trying to just keep us in the cut, you know what I mean? I ain't know, you're not gonna keep me in the cut. I'm not that kind of dude, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna speak my mind, I think they ain't like that. So at that point, I just, I just tapped out, like, you know what, man? Fuck this music shit, y'all can have it. I started doing other stuff, drawing and doing movies with Sal. And I ain't do music for about maybe six, six years. But you know what I mean? It was, we was connecting with each other along. Throughout them six years, we connecting with each other. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing it. Like, so I'm like, yo, I wanna do this. And he come like, yo, I got some tracks. Whatever we gonna do, we gonna do it. Eventually, as I develop as an artist, you know, I'm, for all the people that's paying attention, they gotta pay attention, it's a good growth. Um, and I talk about that all the time, but something clicked, something clicked. It was one record we did, um, it was Traumatized first. First, The first one I did was Traumatized. Before I did Die Alone, I did Traumatized. Um, I did it in a few different studios, and the sound was just trash. It wasn't the music, it wasn't the beat, it wasn't the artist, it just was the sound coming from the studio, and I'm used to working out of top-notch studios, especially coming from messing with Naughty and all that other stuff, you know what I mean? I, well, Poop, rather. I would say Poop, not Naughty. I was messing with Poop. Um, and to go in different studios and get that kind of sound, I just it was making me uncomfortable, you know? But um, Traumatized was a record that I did based on the field that I work in, right? And I work in the field dealing with young people ages 16 to 24, drop out of high school, and, you know, they just into the streets. You know, my job is to transition them from a lot of stuff that they do. You know, um, that created traumatized. 
when I did it over at um, Mo Sound Studio with Shaheed, because me and Hip went in there, and he heard what we was listening for. Then we did Die Alone. So the development, the development and the growth for me went from a boy to a man, because only a man is going to tell you the truth. These boys ain't gonna tell you the truth. They wanna manipulate you to feed into their life. They wanna play victim to the environment that you live in. You can't play victim no more. We live in a technology age. Anything you wanna know, you can, you can go on the internet and find. There's no excuse for what we go. There's no excuse. You know, it's, it's no excuse when you look at Hove. Hove is from the hood. People are calling us Illuminati stuff. We went from the hood to a billionaire. You, what more you need to see? It's so much, what more you need to see at this point? You know what I'm saying? It ain't just him, it's many other artists, you know what I mean? So at that point it was development and growth to me. And I just, I'm not afraid, like it said, he ain't afraid to be himself. I ain't afraid to talk about what I'm gonna talk about. I ain't, I ain't afraid to tell a real story. Cause I'm gonna tell it. I'm gonna tell it. Some people just ain't gonna tell it, you know what I mean? And I guess it's because they, it's about how people perceive them, how people see them, you know? So. He has a story to tell. How does the music capture the essence of the story and not drown him out when he rhymes? Um, interesting, because, again, everything I make is for me. Um, and I make everything. So whatever someone comes to me with, more than likely I, I have it. <laughs> or I can make it. I'm not afraid to go where I need to go. If he had a story about going to space, I, I either have it or I can make something for it. I'm not, I'm not afraid to do any of that stuff. And again, that's basically how me and another artist would come together. Like whatever your thing is, then we can go there. Well, I've already been there. It's interesting. Devastating. Thank you for watching our presentation. We ask that you subscribe to our YouTube family and hit the notification bell for updates. Please like, comment, and share this video. Real, real hip hop. We here.